the Confederate Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Birmingham, Alabama, disassembled on June 1st, 2020. A statue of Albert Pike in Washington, D.C., toppled by protesters and set on fire on Juneteenth, 2020. A statue of a Confederate soldier in Raleigh, North Carolina, pulled down and dragged through the streets by protesters on June 20th, 2020. All of these monuments have been points of contention in their local communities for years. Calls for their removal, along with hundreds of Confederate memorials across the country, have taken over the headlines. Thousands have taken to the streets in protest of police brutality and racial inequality following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. State leaders have responded to these calls, ordering the removal of any and all statues commemorating the Confederacy. But the largest monument to the Confederacy still remains, the Stone Mountain Monument in Georgia. The Mount Rushmore of the Confederacy, it sits 400 feet above the ground and features a 42-foot deep, 76 by 158-foot carving of Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. But removing it could require bitter political debate and a year-long process of blowing it off piece by piece with explosives. So what should America do with its largest Confederate monument? And why has it existed this long? Well, its history is more troubling than you might have imagined. Stone Mountain is a geological wonder. At 1,683 feet tall and covering 583 acres, it is the largest piece of exposed granite in the world, and humans have been interested in the mountain for centuries. Paleo-Indians showed interest in the mountain's structure as early as 4,000 BC, and stone walls were erected at the top of the mountain, likely sometime between 100 BC and 500 AD. But it wasn't until the late 1800s that humans began using the mountain on a more massive scale. In 1869, Stone Mountain Granite and Railway Company began mining the geological structure for granite. This job would later be taken over by the Venable Brothers in 1882, who would harvest 200,000 paving blocks per day. Remember that name, it'll be important later. The granite from Stone Mountain has found its way around the world. Blocks from the quarry form parts of the steps on the east wing of the U.S. Capitol, other blocks are used in the locks of the Panama Canal and in the Imperial Hotel building in Tokyo. But others saw value in Stone Mountain beyond its granite. In 1915, Stone Mountain became a center point of the Ku Klux Klan's revival. This was fueled by two main events. The first involves a twin murder. In 1913, a 13-year-old child laborer named Mary Fagan was found strangled in an Atlanta pencil factory. Leo Frank, the factory's superintendent and member of a prominent Jewish family, was falsely convicted of the murder. His original death sentence was changed to a life sentence which angered members of the KKK. An armed mob snatched Frank from a prison and hung him in the girl's hometown in 1915. Later, in 1986, a witness would come forward and the Georgia Board of Parole would grant Frank a posthumous pardon. The second event was the Atlanta debut of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. This silent film depicted African Americans as sexual predators who defiled white women, all while portraying the KKK as heroes coming to the rescue. The film motivated William J. Simmons, who became the fraternal organizer of the second KKK. On Thanksgiving night in 1915, he led a group of 15 men to the summit of Stone Mountain. They set up an altar, opened a Bible, and burned a 16-foot cross as part of an initiation ceremony. This ushered in a new era of white nationalist terrorism. Around the same time, the revisionist, lost cause of the Confederacy movement was on the rise. This ideology sought to minimize preserving slavery and, instead, maximize Southern honor and state sovereignty. It held that the cause fought for by the Confederate states during the Civil War was a just, heroic one. Editor John Temple Graves also published an editorial in the Atlanta Georgian on June 14, 1914. Graves' argument was straightforward. The South deserved a monument dedicated to its Confederate heroes, and Stone Mountain was the perfect blank slate. The first fundraising campaign to construct the monument began in 1915. Honorary Life President of the Atlanta United Daughters of the Confederacy, Helen C. Plain, pushed to erect a memorial for her husband and other Confederate soldiers who lost their lives in the Civil War. She brought the idea of a memorial before the city and state chapters of the United Daughters of the Confederacy and quickly gained support. Soon after, the group selected Klansman Gutzen Borglum as the sculptor and construction was set to begin in 1916. Borglum's vision for the monument centered around a carving of former president of the Confederacy Jefferson Davis and generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. The leaders were to be surrounded by an army of as many as 1,000 figures spread across the face of the mountain. 
but due to funding issues and World War I, construction didn't begin until 1923. After a year's work, Borglum could only carve General Lee's head, and in 1925, a disagreement between Borglum and management led him to leave the project and go on to carve Mount Rushmore. At this point, the land deed from the Venable Brothers only had three years remaining before it was set to expire. A second sculptor, Augustus Lukeman, removed Borglum's previous work and carved out the three figures we see today, but was forced to leave the project in 1928. The land deed expired and the Venables took back their claim on the mountain. The monument remained untouched for the next 36 years. Then, in the 1950s, people began to take interest in the project yet again. The 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision made it unconstitutional for schools to remain segregated. This, along with the growing influence of the civil rights movement, sparked the revival of Stone Mountain's construction. The anti-civil rights sentiment was pervasive. In his inaugural address, Governor-to-be Marvin Griffin addressed his constituents on his disdain of the country's changing environment, stating that, so long as Marvin Griffin is your governor, there will be no mixing of the races in the classrooms of our schools and colleagues of Georgia. Griffin went on to purchase the rights to the mountain, with assistance from the Georgia General Assembly using $1 million in public funds. He made the Stone Mountain Memorial Association a state authority, which gave him the power to appoint its board of directors. Griffin and the Stone Mountain Memorial Association chose Walter Kirkland Hancock as the third sculptor, and the work would resume in 1964. The dedication ceremony was held in 1970, and the gargantuan Confederate monument was finally finished two years later. I grew up in Tucker. It's five miles from Stone Mountain. Okay. Went to church in Stone Mountain. Episcopal church right at the base of the mountain. And Episcopalians, like Catholics, have a midnight mass. Christmas Eve. This is Professor Charles S. Bullock III, a professor of political science at the University of Georgia. And I remember multiple years going to church and coming out at midnight and looking up on the mountain and seeing the burning cross of the Ku Klux Klan. And I always thought, wow, here we are celebrating, you know, this Christian holiday of forgiveness and love. And here, several hundred feet above me, is a symbol of hate. Little has changed in terms of the mountain's physical structure, but there has been a major shift in how the monument is perceived. What started out as an area synonymous with the KKK's gatherings and a renewal of white supremacist activity has, over the years, become a topic for debate over what should be done with the carving. Should it be torn down or should it remain untouched? For those who want to preserve it, the argument comes down to embracing its heritage and preserving history. I guess one of the arguments against it is that <clears throat> you really can't erase history, that uh, whether you liked it or not, there was a confederacy. and. Um, you know, it, it did exist, and um, it's well that people know about it and then put it in the context of what it was all about, and then maybe even use as a baseline to say, well, you know, those were, were terrible times. We've come a long way since then. Still, many others call for the removal of the memorial, arguing that keeping it intact will only preserve the long-held symbolism of white supremacy that defined a generation of terror for many African Americans. What is the culture of racism, the mm -hmm. culture of white supremacy? That is what it does. It is celebrates white supremacy as part of Georgia's state's policy. That is the significance. The, the Confederate States of America fought a war against the United States of America. And we should not be celebrating uh, their fight to, against America. I mean, not that you don't remember it, but it's nothing to celebrate. That's Richard Rose, the president of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP. He is also the president of the National Coalition to End the Confederates, whose main goal is to end the public uh, display of Confederate monuments and celebrations. My role and my goal is to uh, undo the normalization um, of these things. These things have kind of been hidden in plain sight. Many others agree with Rose, arguing that the Stone Mountain Monument symbolizes a history of hate and oppression. Well, I mean, right now, the cultural significance is um, a symbol of hate. And that's, you know, that's part of our past, so that's a real thing, but it's not something that we should really celebrate. It's an opportunity to transform that symbol of hate into a symbol of peace. But we have to do something. We have to do something to make that happen. We have to be deliberate and intentional about it. It has to change. Now, what would removing the monument entail? First and foremost, there is one significant legal barrier to overcome. The memorial is explicitly protected by state law. In 2001, Georgia voted to remove its Confederate stars and bars from the state flag. 
This pushed Confederate supporters to pass a state law that protected the stone mountain carving from being altered, removed, concealed, or obscured in any fashion for all time. Also, a 2017 poll conducted by NPR, PBS NewsHour, and Marist University indicated that 62% of respondents believe statues honoring Confederate leaders should remain standing as historic symbols. With these views permeating the debate, the removal process becomes lengthy and likely politically controversial. And that's not even taking into consideration the practicality of the project. What took decades to carve out would also take a year-long process to remove. A monument, as we've seen, you know, you can hook a crane up to and you can lift it and remove it. Now, this is, this is multi-acres of space we're talking about. I have no doubt that with enough dynamite, you could, you could blast it off. But, again, what I've read is it would take years, perhaps, of planning exactly how you're gonna, gonna blast this off. The discussion of how to remove the memorial hasn't stopped at the use of powerful dynamite. In fact, some have proposed a more natural, less costly alternative. The real problem with it is that it sits at the end of this sort of triumphant view, this, you know, law on our mall kind of situation. So we can let, you know, we can stop cleaning it and the trees would start to grow on it and vegetation, just like they grow in every other crack in the mountain. Big trees coming out of little tiny cracks. It would grow vegetation for sure if it wasn't cleaned. And then that lawn can just grow back into a forest. Gravel proposes that this method could cause less damage to the mountain and the area surrounding it than if the mountain were to be blasted off. And if you could do that, the sculpture is still there technically, but it illustrates an intention of where, we, where we're going as a state, as a culture, as a people, uh, but also for the park. Today, with around 4 million visitors each year, Stone Mountain Park is Georgia's most visited tourist attraction and offers outdoor amenities like hiking trails, an amusement park, and a popular laser show. So the monument and its controversial history is not always at the forefront of visitors' minds as they enter into the park. I think a lot of people don't know what it is. I was at the mountain a few weeks ago, ran into a young couple at the base of the mountain. They were talking about it as a um, engineering feat. You know, they had no idea who the people were. They didn't know that those people were, you know, had that history and that they had fought to protect slavery and all of that. So, but for others, it's impossible and even immoral to remain ignorant of its origins. It is a carving of hate. Uh, and so uh, one more than a third of, of Georgians are African-American citizens. So uh, it does harm to that group by its mere presence every day. The monument, they were carved for the wrong reason. They were carved for to, to celebrate white supremacy and white superiority. And as long as that monument stands there on state property, it's, the, the state is endorsing racism. It's endorsing racial oppression. It's endorsing uh, bigotry, racial bigotry. And so that's why it should be, be removed.